Scott has worked as both a professional soldier in the Canadian Forces and as a practicing artist, currently teaching painting at York University. Twice selected for the CFAP in 2006 and again in 2010, his work, and I quote, considers the utopic characteristics of infantry society, qualities that include inverted social norms, separation from society, and the idealization of itself. From his 2006 deployment of seven days training with the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Canadian Regiment, Scott has exhibited his paintings and text-based works in two touring exhibitions, A Brush with War, which is currently showing here at the Canadian War Museum, and also the international group show, Diabolique, curated by Amanda Cashier from the Dunlop Art Gallery. Please welcome Scott Waters. Uh, what I'd like to do is, uh perhaps just focus more on a kind of topic or a concept by way of uh, what I did with CFAP and uh, perhaps how it relates to Dick's introduction. So um, as a start point uh, for my, uh, my talk, what I would say that a lot of my work deals with is this question of distance, uh, of contradiction, and of how those contradictions play out with each other. Uh, you know, at, in soldiering and in art. So uh, this idea of military as uh, grounded in quotidian aspects and also this, uh, the idea of fatality. So my start image is of two sleeping soldiers, which is the most banal, perhaps, of image, but uh, sleeping is the same repose as, as death. Uh, the gear they're wearing obviously takes it out of the, the very domestic, but uh, for, for CFAP and for war art in general, the idea to some degree is how do we relate the world of being a soldier to various audiences, one of whom is, is the civilian audience. So uh, hopefully then this image is relatable because it's this very straightforward act, this act we all do every day and hopefully all wake up from every day. Um, but it all is also quite distant uh, due to the gear. You know, Dick had mentioned that I was a, uh, a serving infantry uh, soldier for, for three years, uh, got out of it because I really didn't enjoy it at the time. Uh, but in, much, in most discussions about my work, the question of me being a former soldier uh, comes up very quickly. Uh, that's from the audience that is civilian or is an art audience because it's, it's a seeming contradiction being an infantry soldier and then being a professional artist. Uh, but when I went back with the soldiers in 2006, I wasn't a former soldier, I'm a civilian, I'm, I'm you know, I'm suspect. Uh, even if I can kind of, you know, I understand the language and I can play the part, I'm still an outsider. Um, but one of my reasons for showing this image as well is that the question of propaganda uh, in an official context usually is kind of floating around on the periphery. Uh, if it's official war art, you know, what's our relationship to the military? Uh, you, know, you know, what are we told to do? What are we told not to do? Uh, no one's really uh, mentioned it, I guess, but really we're given free reign to do whatever we want. There is no direction, uh, insinu insinuation, anything like that. But I, I do think at the same time, for most of us, and I don't want to necessarily uh, blanket every artist in this category, we're all culpable. We all want to be part of the military machine, even for that short period. Even though the body of work is, is critical that comes out of it, there's a, a part of us that has applied because we're interested in soldiering from any number of perspectives. Uh, what I wrote is that we all want to be part of this terrifying machine, even if it's to then subsequently and quite quickly leave that machine uh, behind. Uh, there's any number of self-portraits that are similar to this one. Um, Karen Bailey's portrait on the cover of the Brush with War catalog is one other example, but uh, you know, I, I do think that as artists we want to insinuate ourselves within the program, within the military, but also show our distance from it, which is why I made the stupid expression when I took the self-portrait uh, in the back of a lab. Hopefully it kind of sits on those two uh, kind of qualities. Uh, the question that I kind of began with is how do, how do we connect? We is a, a general blanket term. The we is the civilian audience, the soldiers, myself as something I don't quite know how to position myself. Am I a former soldier? Am I an artist? How do those tensions resolve themselves or do they? And one of the things that I had come to 
recognize and then become very interested in is this distance, this gap between what I would hope to be able to show you as an audience or to show any audience and my ability to do so. Uh, this is a little bit of a non sequitur compared to the other, um, the other paintings, but if you, uh, if you go and see the shows, if you go see the Navy show, which I guess I'm not really supposed to promote, I'm supposed to promote A Brush With War, uh, but there is a uh, Tony Law painting of uh, tribal destroyers in a, a, a nocturnal battle, and Law had made the point that in combat, all you really see is blackness with these little like pockmarks of light, and there's no way to actually see what's going on. And I think that is uh, indicative of my time with the RCR, because all the battle, all the scenarios were at night. But in general, it kind of comes back to this question of, you know, what is actually portrayable? What can we get across, and what, what can we not get across? This painting isn't necessarily indicative of that, but it's got Nocturne in the title, so I chose to use it. So um, Loch Ness Monster, which is which is in the show here, um, was was really it was one of those moments where. You know, as, a, as an infantry soldier, I really grew to hate the job, and when I got out, I ran hard and fast away from the infantry. I spent a year on, uh, on what was called pogey at the time, loafing around, drinking a lot, and hanging out with my friends. Slowly over the course of the years, after going to undergrad and grad school, uh, I found myself being kind of drawn back and questioning this, uh, this idea of the myth of the military and then my own lived experience. One of those is that the the idealized soldier in you know, Tom Clancy movies or, or novels, for example, doesn't exist. But when I was with the RCR, I met a sniper who was beautiful. He was such a pretty guy. Um, his teeth were perfect. And uh, he was smart, articulate, had a really nice haircut. Um, and most of the guys in the infantry are, are kind of like doofuses. Uh, and I include myself in that category. Um, but then it was, it was interesting that I couldn't take his photo because he was a sniper. All I was allowed to document was his hand and his rifle. Uh, and so the, the, the military then kind of self-perpetuates this idea and, and uh, you know, enforces this idea that there is a distance between us as civilians uh, and them as soldiers. So the fact that I couldn't take a photo of this guy who I felt was the debunking of a myth uh, still lives because I can't show you his image. So we end up with this, with distance where the military wants to relate to Canadian society, but at the same time really wants to uh, keep the distance between, if I say them and us, you can understand uh, what I mean by that. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up with the last image here because what I've talked about is my official reasons for uh, doing CFAP. The unofficial reason was that I have a lot of unresolved feelings about my time in the military. Uh, I didn't get to go anywhere, I didn't get to shoot anybody. Uh, we, you know, we're not really allowed to talk about that, but if you join the infantry, you kind of want to. Um, it, it's, it's true enough. So uh, the military in the Cold War is not the military now. I wondered what my reaction would be to being back with the soldiers. So uh, it's a somewhat glib um, response to that question, but I think it is kind of cuts to the core of what's, like, what is soldiering like now compared to my time and that is there's a war going on, there's motivation, and there's money, uh, and those, those three things kind of feed off of each other and uh, have, create now an infantry which is uh, you know, fundamentally different from the infantry of the 80s and the early 90s.